At Starbase headquarters, it was another hugely productive week for SpaceX. Crucial vehicle tests shared the spotlight with rapid facility growth as the promise of making humanity a multi-planet civilization nears closer. Now let's dig into this week's Starship update. Starting off this week shortly after midnight, on Friday morning, Ship 31 was connected to the High Bay Bridge Crane via one of the two-point lifting jigs. The Starship was then lifted off of the turntable and placed on a stand in the back corner. A short time later, over in Mega Bay 2, a flap was seen being raised on the center ship work stand. Never seen before, the ability of these panels to open like this gave us our first real insight as to how the vacuum raptors can be moved into position, while also still allowing workers access to them after all. About an hour and a half later, the work platform was spotted being raised back up to the bottom of the orbital launch table as crews worked towards final preparations for Booster 11 static fire. Once Ship 31 was secured to the stand in the back corner of the high bay, it was disconnected from the two-point lifting jig. Back at the launch site, testing preparations continued as workers began removing the scaffolding from the top of the orbital launch mount. Around 8 o'clock that morning, the work platform was lowered from the launch table and placed onto its waiting stand as crews finished their work around Booster 11's engines. Around that same time, the PA announced the clearing of the pad for the upcoming static fire. Two hours later, an SPMT carrying a weight used to test the bridge cranes was spotted pulling into the entrance of the build site. The SPMT then made its way past the ring yard and into Mega Bay 2. Next, the building's left bridge crane moved into position and was connected to the counterweight tray. Then, the crane lifted the tray of weights and the SPMT was driven out from underneath. Shortly after noon, the detonation suppression system on the orbital launch mount was tested as SpaceX moved closer to the first static fire of Booster 11. A half an hour later, the chopsticks began rising up the tower and were placed into the launch position. The ship quick disconnect arm was then swung back in close to the tower. Back at the build site, after nearly two hours of holding over 140 tons, the bridge crane had completed its certification testing with the counterweight tray and placed it back onto the SPMT. Then, at 4.30 that afternoon, the Flight 4 Super Heavy booster breathed fire for the first time as it performed an apparently successful static fire of its 33 Raptor engines. Following the static fire, the ship quick disconnect arm once again swung away from the tower. The chopsticks were then closed and returned to the base of the tower before the arm was swung back in. Early the next morning, the two-point lifter stand was delivered to the build site where it was parked across from the doorway into High Bay. A few hours later, the orbital launch mount work platform was moved back over to the orbital pad. Then, under the light of the Saturday morning sun, the platform was raised back up to the bottom of the launch table. We could also see one of the recently delivered vaporizers that was being lifted by a crane and installed near the horizontal tanks at the orbital tank farm. Also of note, venting was seen from the first of the new horizontal tanks at the same time, the first venting seen from any of those tanks. Just after noon, Booster 11's transport stand was moved back over to the orbital pad as SpaceX began to prepare for removing the Super Heavy from the mount. A second vaporizer followed the first a short time later as SpaceX continues to work on the upgrades to the orbital tank farm. That evening, the two-point lifter that was used on Ship 31 the day before was seen rolling out of the high bay on its stand. It was then moved out of the build site and taken over to the Sanchez site for storage. On Sunday morning, the chopsticks once again began rising up the tower and eventually were moved to Booster 11's lifting points. Then, a couple of hours later, the Flight 4 Super Heavy booster was lifted off the orbital launch mount and transferred onto its awaiting transport stand. Once it was secured to the stand, the chopsticks were lowered and the dismount was complete. That night, Booster 11 was also moved across the launch site and onto Highway 4. SpaceX then utilized another rolling closure as the Super Heavy made its way back up the road to the build site. Once there, it was taken into Mega Bay 1. First thing on Monday morning, a concrete pump truck was set up near the D2 gate at the launch site where it placed fresh concrete in the area in the front of the new horizontal tanks. 
Around the same time, up the road at the build site, a vacuum Raptor engine was seen being taken into Mega Bay 2, where Ship 30 was waiting for its engine installation. Meanwhile, next door in Mega Bay 1, Booster 11 was lifted off the transport stand and transferred onto the work stand in the back right corner of the building. Then, with the booster once again on one of the work stands, the transporter stand was rolled out of Mega Bay 1 and taken to the Sanchez site for storage. Shortly before 3 o'clock that afternoon, Sea Level Raptor number 319 was brought into Mega Bay 2. Working quickly, the engine was seen being lifted into Ship 30's engine bay. About an hour after, Vacuum Raptor number 368 was also moved into Mega Bay 2 in preparation for its installation. After another hour or so, the engine was lifted for integration inside of Ship 30's skirt. Meanwhile, down at the launch site, the linkage for one of the clamp arms of the orbital launch mount was seen being lifted out of the center of the structure. It's not yet known if these were damaged or being upgraded or being removed for some other reason. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, Sea Level Raptor 269 was moved into Mega Bay 2 and raised into Ship 30's skirt for installation. Next, Vacuum Raptor 398 went into the building and was also lifted and installed. At 6 o'clock in the morning, the elevator floor of the engine installation stand descended once more, and the entire crew who had been working through the night gathered on the raised platforms inside the stand. This appears to have been a group photo, likely celebrating the completion of Ship 30's engine installations. A few minutes later, the white stand used for transporting vacuum Raptor engines was also rolled out from the elevator floor. These stands, never seen before, appear to be self-propelled and remote-controlled. Over at the site of SpaceX's new office building, workers continue to push forward with the installation of the structural steel for the five-story building. Down the road at the launch site, a new prefabricated metal structure was spotted being delivered into D4 gate by the orbital tank farm. This came from the build site and looks like it could be a protective shield to help protect some of the farm during a launch. At the same time, venting was also seen from the third of the horizontal tanks at the orbital tank farm as SpaceX continues working to bring the new hardware online. Also that morning, workers were spotted installing rebar for a new concrete wall along the road next to the D2 gate. This looks to be the same location that we saw the concrete pump truck the day before, meaning that it was likely placing the foundations for this new wall. Over next to the electrical bunker, a crane was spotted removing a large section of HVAC ductwork. This is likely being removed to allow for more robust upgrades given the proximity to the launch pad. A few hours later, the previously delivered prefabricated shield structure was lifted by the crane and installed next to the electrical bunker. It's possible that the new ductwork will go underneath this shield. That afternoon, another of the constraining links was removed from one of the clamp arms on the launch mount as SpaceX continues to work on that part of the infrastructure. Overnight, Tuesday into Wednesday, the front door of the booster quick disconnect shielding was removed. This structure has shown a decent amount of wear from the first three launches, so its replacement isn't a huge surprise. A bit after 7 o'clock on Wednesday morning, a crane in Mega Bay 2 was seen lifting one of the legs for a ship work stand and moving it to the back left corner of the building for reinstallation. Over the next hour or so, the other legs for the stand followed as crews worked towards getting that workstation back up and functional. Down at the launch site, crews started installing framework for the new concrete wall next to the D2 gate. This wall is being built where the container wall was before being demolished after not holding up to the forces of a Starship launch. That afternoon, a new bridge crane girder arrived at the build site to await installation inside the Star Factory building. On Thursday morning, a robotic welding station arrived at the ring yard after being relocated from the eastern side of the Star Factory. About two hours later, it was moved into Mega Bay 2 and lifted over to the right side of the building. Installing these workstations is critical to getting Mega Bay 2 online for stacking operations rather than just seeing the engine work we've been seeing lately. Later that morning, one of the cranes at the Massey Outpost was spotted moving one of the prefabricated sections of the flame bucket for the new ship static fire stand. Shifting this closer to the trench may be an indication that they're moving quickly towards installation of this hardware. 
At the launch site, workers continued preparing the rebar and form work for the new concrete wall being built next to the D2 gate. Over at the orbital pad, five of the hold down clamps on the launch mount were removed. With Booster 11 having performed a successful static fire, SpaceX seems to be taking advantage of the gap between that test and the next launch to replace or upgrade a lot of the hardware on the mount. That afternoon, a trailer loaded with the removed clamp arm linkages was spotted on Highway 4 hauling the hardware away from the launch site. Back over at the Massey Outpost, a second prefabricated section of the flame bucket followed the first and was also staged closer to the trench. A few hours later, a piece of structural cradle for the flame bucket was likewise lifted and shifted closer to the ship's static fire station. That evening and into the night, Rover 2 camera caught constraint linkages being lifted to the launch mount for installation. It's not yet clear if these are new or if these were removed linkages that then either passed inspection or were refurbished and are now being reinstalled. Switching over to Florida, early on Friday, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 launched its 14th mission as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 with 23 more Starlink satellites. On Saturday afternoon, Booster 1076 was lifted off the dockside stand and laid onto the horizontal transporter for its return to Roberts Road for refurbishment. A few hours later, Bob Toe just read the instructions out to sea in support of the upcoming Starlink Group 6-48 mission. That evening, Lab Padre's own 6-1 NAPS was on the scene in California as Falcon 9 Booster 1081 lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base for the Starlink Group 8-1 mission. This launch is notable because six of its 21 Starlink satellites are equipped with direct-to-cell capability. On Sunday morning, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back into Port Canaveral, carrying Booster 1069 from Friday's Starlink launch. A few hours later, the rocket was lifted off of the deck of the drone ship and placed onto the dockside stand for leg stowage operations. Later that evening, Launch Complex 39A joined the week's launch fun as Booster 1073 launched the Bandwagon 1 mission from the historic pad. Eight minutes later, the booster performed its landing burn and touched down at landing zone one. Monday afternoon, just over a day after returning to port, booster 1069 was laid onto the transporter for its return to Roberts Road. Early on Tuesday, Doug returned to port with all four of the fairing halves from both the Starlink Group 6-47 and the Bandwagon 1 launches. Late that morning, Gator Cam caught a pair of fairing halves also leaving the port, heading back to Roberts Road to be prepared to fly again. Then, seven minutes before one o'clock local time, ULA concluded the historic, more than 60-year legacy of their Delta rocket family as the last Delta IV Heavy launched the NROL-70 mission from Space Launch Complex 37B. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, Space Launch Complex 40 saw its second launch in under a week, with the Starlink Group 6-48 mission lifting off with another 23 satellites. Late that afternoon, it was back to work for a short fall of Gravitas as the drone ship was towed back out to sea in support of the next Starlink mission. About six hours later, Doug followed the drone ship out to sea in support of fairing recovery operations for that same launch. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.